Well, thank you, and thank you to the UK Parliament Open Lecture Series for inviting me to talk to you, and also thank you to the European Parliament Office, which is also represented here. I'm sure you all know, but this year marks 40 years of the European Union and Britain's membership of the EU. We first joined in 1973, so it's a significant anniversary and one that I'm pleased to be able to give this talk on uh, because it's been a checkered time for the UK. We haven't always wanted to be there, we haven't always been too positive about the EU, but I'm here to put the pro case. I'm, as you know, a Labour MEP, um, and every Labour MEP these days is pro-Europe. We're there to represent the people of this country, and we believe very strongly in what we do, and we believe very much in the European Union. And the EU is actually a fascinating and interesting place. When I first arrived, which was a long time ago now, 13 years ago in 2000, the thing that struck me first was just how very international it is, which seems obvious, but we don't always appreciate that in this country, uh, where everybody speaks English and even when you're abroad, other people speak English. But I was suddenly in an environment when there were fewer languages than there are now because it was before the enlargement, but it was a huge experience to be there with people from across Europe sharing common issues and common problems and making common and legislation and it's something I will never forget because it was a, a unique privilege and now of course the EU is even bigger uh, it's 27 member states with 23 official languages stretching from the north of Finland to Cyprus in the south and I think speaking to you today uh, it would be wrong not to mention Cyprus which sadly is very much in the news for all the wrong reasons um, I think actually, and I will say this right at the beginning, the, the levy was a mistake. The levy on savings, I think, was a huge error. And I think that it's uh, perhaps one of the most, certainly not maybe the most disastrous mistakes, but it may prove to be one of the mistakes that the leaders of the Eurozone have made so far in the crisis. And although the crisis clearly needs to be dealt with and the Euro is not yet through it, I think we should avoid the Eurozone crisis colouring what we think about the European Union because it's not just Europe and the Euro which has problems. The UK economy isn't doing too well at the moment either. We have actually had a double-dip recession which the Euro has in fact avoided. So we are in the midst of a global economic crisis and I think we should remember that when we talk about the euro and I think it's unfortunate in this country when we have media news press reports on Europe it's always or almost always um, I won't tar all the media with quite the same brush but it's almost always the downside and I think we get therefore a very distorted picture of what goes on in the European Union and the European Parliament and one of the things that I hope to do in the next half an hour or so is put the other side of the case the positive case no one would say at all that everything in the EU is perfect and we don't need to change anything. No institution anywhere can claim that. And I would be one of the first people to point out that there are things which need changing. And I think everybody in the pro-European camp would agree with that. But what we don't hear enough of is the advantages, the positive things about the EU. And I'm hoping that you will go away with a slightly better understanding, at least as good an understanding as I can give you, of the way that we in the European Parliament see it and the good sides of the EU. I must say, though, before I start that in any great detail, that the EU is not and has no pretensions to ever be a super state. It's something that we hear a lot in this country that, oh, the EU's taking over everything, it's going to somehow or other become this massive United States of Europe. That is not the intention. That's never been what the EU was set up to do. And we are absolutely not on that route. The EU has a very clear set of competencies which it carries out. And 
it's delineated clearly and the principle of subsidiarity, uh, which I'm sure you all know, is that member states devolve power down to the lowest possible level and decisions are taken at the lowest possible level is very strong indeed. So we are not an EU super state and we're not going anywhere near that. I will also say at the beginning that those who call for a referendum on EU membership at the moment certainly really don't, I think, understand the full implications of such a referendum. We have been, as I said at the beginning, in the EU for 40 years. That is a whole generation, and I suspect a lot of you weren't even born in 1973 when Britain joined the EU. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of history, it's a lot of shared values, it's a lot of shared legislation, and it would take an enormous amount of unpicking, not to mention the economic instability and the difficulties that may be caused by any attempt or any thoughts even of withdrawing from the EU. As far as I'm concerned, it's an absolute non-starter. And I think it's clear that, I mean, you, that is now, that's my position and I wanted to make that clear to you before I started because that's very much where I'm coming from and the Labour MEPs are coming from. But what I really want to talk to you about today is the EU itself in more detail, both the history and the background and what is going on at the moment and a bit about what I do there and my own experiences of working in the Parliament. So I want to cover why and how the EU was set up, what the EU stands for, certain milestones in the history of the EU, how the institutions work, what the EU has achieved and benefits of EU membership, some of the current issues that we're facing and what the future might be. The EU, as I'm sure you all know, was created at the end of the Second World War out of the ruins of Europe um, and, and, what, and the, the real collapse of Europe at the end of the Second World War when certain leaders of certain main countries came together and decided that they wanted to deal with this once and for all. And I think it was actually a very positive step, not only to build and recreate from the ruins of Europe. But also I think what the EU did at that time was represent a new humanitarianism after the awful happenings of the Second World War. You see emerging in Europe at the time and continuing much more of a respect for life, uh, which is why the EU has, as some of its funding and fundamental principles, equality and respect for individuals, gender equality, anti-racism, and all of that came out of the horrors of the Second World War. It was also set up to combat nationalism, um, which obviously was a major factor in the causes and the duration of the Second World War, and had been in the First World War, when then and before the response to trade, trade difficulties and disputes and to territorial disputes was actually to go to war. And that had always been the history of the Europe since the fall of the Roman Empire. So we're talking for a very, very, very long time. And the EU sought to overcome those negative attitudes and to build something much more positive in its place. Of course, there was also communism, and I would be wrong if I claimed the EU was completely idealistic, because it wasn't. And part of the founding of the EU was to be a bulwark against the communist countries to the east. Um, and also, of course, importantly, to provide a European voice along with the American voice in dealing with the Soviet threat and Soviet battleground. And there was also the other aspect, practical aspect coming out of the Second World War was martial aid and the Marshall Plan. And it was felt that the countries who were benefiting from the Marshall Plan would be well advised to get together to actually have form a common view on that. So the EU was set up, I think, mainly for idealistic reasons, although obviously practical elements as well. But certainly the founding fathers, as they're still known, and they sadly were all fathers, um, 
that had, had a very idealistic view of where they wanted to go. Uh, and I think we still hold on to that in, in many ways across the EU. And the EU itself, when it was formed, did learn from the lessons of the past. The interwar League of Nations had largely failed because it was just that. It was a collection of member, member states, of national, um, of national states, who really didn't have an awful lot in common and, and couldn't quite work together for common goals. So the, those who founded the EU were determined that that wasn't going to happen again. Um, and it also, I think, reflected and grew out of the the internationalism and the desire to cooperate, which was again a legacy of the horrors of the Second World War. There were quite a lot of bodies which were set up at a similar time. The United Nations itself, of course, NATO, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, the Council of Europe as well. Um, they were all, all happened at a similar time during the 1950s when it was felt that um, war was, had just really just, just been too awful to contemplate again and international cooperation was the, the way forward and the EU I think was the, 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 the shining example of that if you like because it was and still is obviously much more than just an international organisation working together for common goals. Um, there are those who believe that the EU should be further integrated and there are um, and political integration is a, a worthwhile goal and there are others who think that we should go wider and not have such a level of political integration but we should continue to work as we are now and very much on the same sort of level as we are now. Um, and that has always been quite a debate in the EU. Um, my own view on that is that now we're 27 member states. Uh, Croatia is due to join quite soon, and so we will be 28 in the not too distant future. I don't think that's. I, I, I don't think closer political integration, in the sense that it was envisaged 30, 40 years ago, is actually. Is, is actually something that can be achieved very easily when you've got such a large European Union. So I don't think that's going to go very much further. We will see the EU working on the basis that it is now. Um, I believe a common currency which is changing and evolving and that may lead to some further political union, but I think it's very difficult to see that happening um, with such a large um, EU, with, with the, the, the size it is now, to any meaningful political extent. Um, but it will be interesting to watch how that debate goes. And of course, we, we are, to a large extent, in in the, the UK on the sidelines of that because we aren't in the Euro we are not involved in a lot of those debates and discussions within the Eurozone and we would in any event I think resist further political integration having set up in the way been set up in the way that it was it will come as no surprise to you to learn that the EU actually has a very strong and fundamental value base <clears throat> and certain principles which the EU is founded on and which a lot of MEPs certainly talk about very eloquently and they are basically democracy, the rule of law, human rights, respect and protection of minorities and a functioning market economy. And we're also looking at the capacity to cope with competitive pressures and market forces within the EU, adherence to the aims of economic and monetary union, and all members to enact the body of European law, which is known as the Acquis Communautaire, as I'm sure you know. So the values are, are very important and something which we talk about quite often um, and talk about quite often also in the context of legislation which I think is slightly unusual for a British audience because it, it isn't viewed in the same way here and we don't discuss things in those kind of abstract concepts in the same sort of way but I think it's worth emphasising this because those values are very important to the way the EU functions and very important to member states and actually very important to those of us who are representatives in the European Parliament. <clears throat> 
the milestones. Well, the EU was, or the, as it was, the European community grew out of the European coal and steel community, which was set up in 1951, really quite early on, and the founding members were the six founding members of the, what came to be the EEC, Belgium, France, West Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. They believed in integration. They thought that integration then might go, go, might be something that they would wish to see projected into the future. And they wanted that rather than just cooperation. So from the very beginning, the EU was set up as an organisation which was not just going to be about international cooperation or European cooperation. It was going to be about more than that. And it was going to involve, even at that point, some pooling of sovereignty. Now, British people and, and, and the certain members of the House of Commons get very worked up about this idea of sovereignty. Um, I, I think it's quite an emotionally charged word. But basically what, what it means is that you will hand over some of your power on the basis that you will get something back in return. Um, so it's not really a giving up of, of anything, it's actually an exchange. And I think that's actually what the EU's always been about. Um, it's an, it's, it's a, a deal, if you like. We will do that with you, and in return, we will get that out of the organisation. And it's something that started right at the very beginning. 1957 was the Treaty of Rome, which set up the European Economic Community, the common market it was known, um, and also Euratom, because, of course, the other threat that was very much hanging over the world at this time was atomic weapons, which I think did, as, as well as the good things that shaped the post-Second World War settlement, I think the fear of nuclear weapons was perhaps the, the negative side of it. In 1960, the European Free Trade Association was established, which included Britain. 1968 was the European Customs Union, um, which was the, the EEC plus one or two others, including Turkey, rather interestingly. Turkey's association with what is now the EU goes back that long. And it was, act, in fact, the customs union was exactly what it said. It removed all internal customs duties and quotas and established a common external tariff. 1973 was the first enlargement of the European Union, um, which Denmark and Ireland joined, and of course the UK. That's 40 years ago when Britain became a member of the EEC. 1974, the European Council was created, which is the, the, the member state governments um, and is one of the three institutions which make up the European Union, as I'm sure you all know. There's the European Parliament, the Council of Ministers and the European Commission. And those are the three institutions which, from this time onwards, were to form the EU and were to be the basis of the legislative process in the EU. 1979 was the first year that there were direct elections to the European Parliament. Before that time, member state governments had sent representatives to the European Parliament, but 1979 was the first direct elections. 1981, rather interestingly, Greece joined the EU. So Greece has been a member of the EU for a very long time um, as a matter of interest. And what I think we saw then, um, after direct elections to the European Parliament, after the enlargement of the 1970s, I think what we saw was an increase in confidence in the EU um, and an idea that maybe it was becoming an accepted institution and that there were things that could be taken forward. And I think what's also interesting during this period is that in this country, the attitudes of the two political parties were exactly the opposite from what they are now. The Labour Party was very opposed to the EU and, and, e, and or the common market and membership of the common market then, whereas the Conservative Party was much more in favour of it. And I think one of the interesting things about politics in this country in relation to the EEC and the EU is how that has really changed to be completely the other way around. Of course, in 1986, one of the really big issues, one of the really defining moments of the EU took place. 
And that was the setting up of the single market, the single European Act, interestingly done by Margaret Thatcher. Um, and it was intended to do exactly that, to provide an internal market for goods and services across the whole of the EU without barriers. And there were four things that it set up to do. Movement of free, free movement of people, goods, services, and money. Um, and it remains to this day the one thing that people who are e opposed to EU, don't even like membership of the EU, want to maintain. I have yet to meet a politician on any side of any political fence, except maybe some of the more extreme UKIP members who want Britain to leave the single market. And an awful lot of subsequent EU legislation was actually linked to the single market and was intended to make the single market more effective. Um, and so I think it's important to hang on to this because after the mid-1980s, the single market really was, to a very large extent, what the EU was about. It had become a trading area. And it's a very important one these days for us. Um, almost half of the ex our exports from the UK go to the European Union single market. Were we not to have access to that, it would be serious, incredibly serious. And also, all the social legislation, or most of the EU social legislation, which features a lot in debates in this country at the moment, is designed to provide a level playing field across Europe so that no individual member states has an advantage or a disadvantage in the single market because they have uh, perhaps social legislation which isn't quite as good as other member states. So all the social legislation was set up for that very reason. So you have health and safety regulations across the EU which employers have to and, and governments have to undertake because if you had stringent measures in one country and measures which were pretty lax in another. That would give the country that had the lax regulations far more of an advantage in the single market. And I think this is worth actually holding on to because that's the point of the social legislation. It's to actually provide not only good working conditions across the EU but also to provide a level playing field in the single market. It's an absolutely integral part of it. The other thing that happened with the establishment of the single market was that qualified majority voting was extended. Um, and that's where member states have weighted votes in the Commission and the Council uh, so that no one country can veto proposals. Um, and that, that was an important part too of the m agreement over the single market. Also in the mid-1980s, Spain and Portugal joined. Of course, after that was the cataclysmic events of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of communism, which changed the face of Europe um, and were soon to change the face of the EU. Um, and in 1991, um, not necessarily linked to it, but 1991 was another important year in the history of the EU because that was the Maastricht Treaty, which began to pave the way for the setting up of the euro. Um, it was the agreement to move forward to a single currency. And as you all know, you, the UK had an opt-out from, from the Maastricht Treaty, and we have not as yet joined the euro. Um, also in the late mid-1990s, Austria, Finland, Sweden joined, joined, and we also set up the Schengen Agreement which is quite significant. Um, and because the UK isn't in it, we don't hear very much about it. But the Schengen Agreement actually did away with border controls. So it's now possible to go across Europe without a passport. Um, and it just has helped internal movement quite significantly. Um, so the, the late 1980s and the early 1990s were a very significant time indeed. Then, of course, in 2002 was the introduction of the euro. Um, and then in 2004, the accession of the former communist countries in the east of Europe, as well as 
um, Malta and, of course, Cyprus. So that's when we ended up being a European Union of 27 member states, um, what well, with 25 then, and Bulgaria and Romania joined slightly later. And it's this enlargement um, and this actually absorbing the countries of Eastern Europe was the main reason why the EU was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, which sadly was ridiculed to a large extent in this country, I think very unfairly, because the EU has, amongst other things, kept the peace. I mean, I, I, there is an argument that Europe may have stayed at peace anyway, but certainly the setting up of the EU and the absorbing of the former communist countries, I think, has actually contributed to a peaceful Europe. So that anyone born after the Second World War in Europe, certainly in Western Europe, has not had to face the threat of destruction which our parents or grandparents and great-grandparents suffered. And I think that's, you know, that, that is a big achievement and should be recognised. After the Euro, we saw the Lisbon Treaty, which was aimed at modernising the EU after the enlargement, um, and uh, set up various things which have shaped the way that the EU operates now. Um, we've got a president of the European Council now, it's Herman van Rompuy. Um, we have the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, who is the British Commissioner, Baroness Catherine Ashton. Um, the European Parliament itself actually has gained more power over legislation. We do have legislated co-decision, as we call it, with the Council of Ministers in most areas now, not all of them, but most of them. Um, and what that means is that when legislation comes through the Parliament, if it is legislation which is part of the co-decision process, we will go through it in committee, we will amend it, it will go through the plenary session of the European Parliament, and then it will go to the European Council. If there's disagreement between what the Parliament wants and <clears throat> what the European Council wants, there will then be a process called conciliation where we aim to sort out those differences. In fact, we have to sort them out because if, if the points at issue haven't been resolved within six weeks, the entire piece of legislation falls. So there's quite a pressure to get it right and, and end it. Um, the other thing, one of the other things that the the Lisbon Treaty did was to involve national parliaments more in the way that the European Parliament works. And I think that's actually, oh, I'll have better lines of communication, which I actually think is quite important because when you have layers of government and layers of legislative making bodies, I think you do need to know what's going on in each particular place and I'm not sure that that's always worked particularly well between the European Parliament and national parliaments. Um, we've also re reduced the number of MEPs obviously and we've taken on some new policy areas under the Lisbon Treaty such as sport and tourism. Um, so that's a brief run through of the key events in the history of the EU which I think has been you know, quite a busy 40 years actually and the EU has grown from quite a small, fairly experimental body, um, and it, it's now very much part of our governance um, and, and something which I think it would be very difficult if to not to have now that we've been in it for such a very long time. In terms of the institutions themselves, um, the European Parliament works very differently from the Parliament where we are now. The whole EU concept is about consensus. It's actually about people talking to each other, trying to resolve any points of issue, and that runs through the whole way that the organisation works. It's not only uh, because consensus is a good thing, which it is, it's also because the EU itself has evolved so that no one country and no one no part of the three parts of the EU, the three institutions, has too much power. It's very much a balance. And we're always trying to balance the interests of larger member states against smaller member states, making sure that, ev that, that things are agreed and, and that, and, and, and that the, the consensus actually works in practice. 
very different, I think, from the British tradition. And I think a lot of us found it an interesting experience when we first started in the European Parliament. Um, we've also tried um, to make the Parliament um, quite a family-friendly place. Um, we do actually do, we work sensible office hours. I mean, we start at nine in the morning and finish at six at night, and we have a rather nice two-hour continental lunch break, which is quite good, except the Brits always work through the lunch break. Um, so it, it's, it's very much, has very much more of a, a working feel about it, I think, than, than some national parliaments, and, and I think that's very good. Um, and it's, it, it's really quite, it, it's really quite, a, I think, a good working environment. And the other thing I want to say to this audience is that, particularly since the 19, the, the 2004 enlargement, English has become very much the working language. All the Eastern European countries had English as their second language. So English is the social language, and quite often, and it's happening more and more, meetings are conducted solely in English because so many people speak English as their second language. We don't seem to understand this or understand just how useful it is for us and, and how much of an advantage it gives us. This is an international institution with 23 official languages and the language that they choose to use as their common one is you know, the language that we speak. And I, I always find there's some sort of irony here about the British attitude to the EU, um, which is semi-detached, often at best, to the fact that the EU has absorbed our language so wholeheartedly. Um, and it's just, it's just one of those rather strange situations. And I think we would do well to ponder on that. Basically, the, the way that the... European political system works was set up on the French model. So it's also like the French and very much like the American model as well. So the European Parliament is a legislature. That's what we do. The Commission and the Council are much more like an administration. And the way it works is that the European Commission, which is comprised at the top level of a commissioner, one commissioner per member state, the Commission will propose legislation. Um, nobody else at the moment has the power to do so, though I think the Commission do take on board what's going on and what would be appropriate legislation and what's important and what's topical. Um, it will then come to the Parliament and to the Council of Ministers to legislate, to amend that, to, um, and then to, to vote on it. Um, it will then, if it needs to be, it will be interpreted by the European Court of Justice and then enforced by the Commission. So that's essentially the process. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's quite useful to, to know that and to remember how it works because I think what people find often a little bit um, unusual and, and, and unlike other experiences is the role of the Commission. And there's quite often criticism of the Commission is not democratic. Um, it's indirectly democratic in that commissioners generally have been politicians in the senior politicians in their own countries, um, and they are appointed by the, the member states. Um, and there's also the question, when it comes to democracy, of the idea, particularly prevalent, I think, in this country, that the EU is not democratic, that there is a democratic deficit. Um, it's true that turnouts in elections to the European Parliament aren't great, but then turnouts to elections in this country for local government aren't very good either, and they're, they're about the same. The, the European Parliament and local government turnouts are, are similar, um, always, almost always. Um, and, of course, the... European Council is made up of member state governments, so that is elected. Um, of course, everything does a five-year term, so, the, so, so you may not actually find the three institutions in synchronisation with each other. Um, but I, I think there's, there's a lot said about the democratic deficit, um, as people choose to refer to it, which is actually not not true in practice. Of course there are things that could be done to make it more democratic and it is still based on member states. In that sense it's not a European-wide electoral body, it's 
it, it, it's MEPs returned from individual member states and member state governments and the commission commissioners appointed by member states. But I, I think when you talk about things like democratic deficits, you have to be a bit clear about the definition of that. And although I don't think the the system of election in the EU is completely perfect, as nothing is, I think um, it's not as bad as many of its detractors would actually make out. And of course, the principle of subsidiarity, subsidiarity, which I mentioned earlier, is important in this context, because nobody in the EU seeks to legislate at European level unless they have to. Um, so. It, legislation is, and rulemaking are done at the lowest possible level and we're always very very clear that that is the case and most important issues are still done by member states taxation social security health education to name but some of the big ones are still done by member states they're not done by the european union so we're not talking about a super state or any sort of supranational infrastructure really we're talking about a few things and we're talking about the internal market and legislation which makes the internal market function better. We're talking a little bit about um, common security and defence policy. Um, and we're talking obviously these days about the euro. Um, what we aren't talking about in the EU and what we don't do is any of those really basic things which are still carried out at member state level. The EU has achieved considerable amount in the last 40 years and one of the things I think I'd like to talk a little bit about is the whole concept of soft power. It's often used in when talking about the EU um, and it's quite important. I mean, the EU does have representation across the world. The EU has been part of peacekeeping forces and we do have, and not very evolved, but there is a common security and defence policy. And there's also power in economic terms where because the EU is such a large trading bloc, it obviously has power and influence in that way. So it's not power in terms of going out and showing that you are bigger and better than everybody else. It's much more influence. Um, and I think that's a good role for the EU because the EU, after all, is its member states. And, 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 and the EU, as a bloc, doesn't want none of us, and, and I don't think anyone in the EU wants to supersede member states. So soft, but soft power is a very helpful way of, of achieving certain useful aims and one of the things I would like to cite in this is Turkey which still hasn't yet joined the EU um, and may not wish to quite as much as it did but there was a time when Turkey very much wanted to become a member of the EU and was very keen to comply with the Aki community the criteria for joining and one of the things that the Aki states is that no EU member state should have the death penalty. Turkey did, of course, and they stopped it. They abolished the death penalty because they wanted to join the EU. So that's a measure, I think, of the sort of, the sort of soft power that we're talking about. Um, there is also um, a lot of trade agreements which are very, I, th I think, very helpful in the modern context. And as we speak, there is a potential trade agreement being uh, negotiated with the United States. Um, and it won't surprise any of you to know that the EU and the United States together account for 50% of the world's GDP and nearly a third of the world's trade flows. So a trade agreement between the EU and the United States would be a good idea. And so Barack Obama, President Obama, has the same idea. And he said that he is encouraged by this and that he's encouraged by the benefits of an ambitious and comprehensive market opening arrangement for agriculture and manufactured goods, services and investment, the identification of ways to promote compatible regulatory approaches and tackle behind the border barriers and possible approaches to intellectual property rights. So that's one of that, that explains, I think, that quote from President Obama very well, the benefits of trade agreements with other countries, and particularly with the United States, and the advantages that would bring to EU, the members of the EU, the member states in the EU, and the United States themselves. Other things that the 
EU has done and benefits it has brought is a high level of environmental protection. Uh, the environment, of course, doesn't stop at national borders and it's an obvious area to be carried out by the EU. Um, the most environmental protection is based on the polluter pays principle and we've seen air and water quality legislation, waste management, biodiversity protection um, and the, the idea of environmental liability. Um, blue flag beaches were an EU initiative um, and things like air quality for those of us who live in London um, or visit London is of course incredibly important. And the other environmental matter which is becoming huge is climate change, where the EU has had a very pivotal role in tackling climate change and, and it, a system for trading emissions which will aim to reduce harmful emissions, harmful carbon emissions particularly, by 20% by 2020. We've also done a lot on consumer protection one of the things that is always cited, which I'm sure you know, is bringing down roaming charges for mobile phones. I was actually on the committee when that went through, and it was a, very, it was a, a really helpful thing to do. And it's just one example of very many consumer protection measures that have gone through. Um, we also, um, even in the midst of the scandal over horse meat, still have a role in. Um, in food safety, we've introduced a lot of legislation on food labelling and what goes in food um, and health measures and those kinds of things. So that's just a very few examples of the kinds of day-to-day -day work that the EU does. Of course, we are facing at the moment a raft of current issues, not only the international debt, the, the sovereign debt crisis in the euro, um, which is uh, not resolved yet by a long way, even though there are moves to establish banking union, that's still clearly got some way to go. The common agricultural policy at the moment, which has always been a thorn in the side of the United Kingdom, is at the moment going through a process of reform, not before time, I might say. The CAP still takes up 20% of EU spending, um, which is an extraordinary amount when you think about it. And it also doesn't, isn't part of the legislative co-decision process. Um, so there's, th there's still quite a lot of major issues around agricultural funding. We're trying to get away from the direct support to producers, which is the basis of it at the moment, and to look more towards development, rural redevelopment, and more environmentally friendly measures, which are called greening of agriculture. But it's still got a long way to go, and there's still quite a lot of vested interests who don't really want the system to change very much. But if you're interested in it, this is all happening at the moment. Um, so it might be, if you want to, it might be something you might be interested in following. Um, We've also seen, to, to look at the wider political um, sphere, the rise of far-right parties across Europe, um, which I think is quite a worrying um, development. I mean, there have been far-right countries in several European countries, um, and I, I think this, this is something which you know, we all need to watch out for, because once those sort of things take hold, it, um, it can actually... Um, it, it can snowball and get get worse. Um, also, the other thing that I particularly wanted to talk about was the tension that comes and goes between the Eurozone members and those who aren't in the Euro. All the new accession countries are due to join the Euro at some point, though not all of them had. had. Um, and this concept of a two-speed Europe, which is talked about sometimes, and obviously if that happened, the UK would be on the outside. Now, I don't think personally that would be a very good place for the UK to be, because we would miss out on being there at the table. And this is important. If you aren't fully part of an institution, you clearly can't have a say in what happens to it. And what happens in the EU does affect this country severely. 
And countries like Norway and Switzerland are often cited as being, oh yes, we can go leave the EU or only be semi-part of the EU and do what they do. Well, Norway, in fact, and Switzerland, both of those countries, Norway particularly, does implement EU regulations. They are bound, or they choose, and they are bound by EU regulations, that they have absolutely no say in what those are. And, if, and the same would be true for any country that were to leave, because the world is becoming a smaller and smaller place, and we are tied economically, we're tied in terms of trade, um, and there's all sorts of ways that Europe is part of a whole and it's very it, it's impossible I, I would say now for any one European country not to be affected by that so if you decide that you're going to leave the EU you lose that place in the negotiations and being able to have some say over what goes on I don't think that's a very good place for us to be and I therefore think that we need to stay where we are make sure that we have that voice and make sure that we are heard and that we can therefore have some impact on the policies of the EU the EU is here to stay um, there is no going back um, and I think we should celebrate the advances that the EU has made. Um, the, there are advances um, and, uh, that I've talked about and there's, there are other things as well. I mean, my contention, having been in the EU for a long time now, having been a member of the European Parliament for a long time now, is that the EU is fundamentally a progressive institution. Um, interestingly at the moment, though I say that, it's, it's completely controlled by the centre-right political parties at the moment. The majority in the European Parliament is centre-right and in the Commission and of course in the Council of Ministers. But even so, um, European Euro the European social model is still very much in existence um, and the values that the EU is founded on are still very much there. There are, of course, huge problems, and no one is denying the depth of the crisis of the euro, but we mustn't forget that it's also a global economic crisis. I firmly believe that the UK has to stay in Europe, and I think I will leave it with a question of what would happen were we to leave. Although President Obama quite clearly welcomes a trade agreement with the EU, it's becoming even more obvious that that's as far as it goes. The United States is now much more looking towards the Pacific, and I think that old relationship where the United States saw Britain as a bridge to the EU and it was all part of the special relationship and the wartime alliances, that's, to all intents and purposes, disappeared. And in a world where we see the rise of new countries, such as India and China, it's important, and it's more important than ever, that the UK stays within the EU, within its large trading bloc. Our place is very firmly there. Um, and if we weren't there, where would we go?